So let's get started. Um, so I'm going to finish up um, energy today, and then we're going to begin sort of section, more or less we'll call it molecular biology, but it's sort of dealing with the issues that revolve around the discovery that DNA was the genetic material, and then working through how people understood how information got from the DNA into everything else, how things were regulated. There were an incredibly number, large number of important discoveries uh, that form the foundation of how we think about biology that are going to come out in this next section. But before I do that, I, I just want to, I want to finish up this, this section that uh, I'd uh, talk to you about, uh, about energy. And I hope as we go along here, you're going to see how some of these sort of disparate parts of the course begin to come together. Almost everything we're going to be talking about now is going to be needing energy, such as replicating DNA or making proteins and all sorts of things. And those are driven by, ultimately, by ATP. And what I've been trying to talk to you about the last lecture or two is how the cell gets the ATP, that the energy money that it needs to make things. We talked through glycolysis, this ancient, ancient way of getting a couple of ATPs out of a molecule of sugar, so well embedded in, in uh, our genetic makeup, it's in almost all organisms. And then I talked last lecture about this other principle, which must have come up very, very early in evolution. Again, it's used by all organisms, and that's the principle of capturing the energy that's inherent in a proton gradient across a membrane. And I talked to you then about a couple of, uh, the idea then, the way it worked was that the cell would have something in its mem membrane that would be a proton pump, and it would pump the, the proton from one side of the membrane to the other. If it's a, so it, it's working against a gradient, so it's doing energy. So there's a couple of different, so the energy needs to be provided. It could be provided by, by some kind of light energy, and that's what drives photosynthesis. I'll say a few words about that. Or in the case of, uh, of respiration with the oxidative phosphorylation, I showed you how as the electrons sort of descend in stepwise fashion uh, down um, uh, from one state to another, they, there's energy given off. Free energy is, is available, and that can be used to power the pump. And once the proton gradient is is uh, made, then the cells can turn it around and make, use that, the energy that's in that proton uh, gradient to make ATP. So in respiration, remember the trick was then to take those two pyruvates, burn them as far as, all the way down to carbon dioxide and water, make as many ATPs and NADHs as you could, then take the NADHs, use them to make a proton gradient, and eventually, if you will, convert everything into ATP, so you've got it as energy. Um, our, our cells do it, that part, respiration and the oxidative phosphorylation is done in mitochondria, which I said was, uh, were sort of came from bacteria that were captured at some point. Here's a picture of a mitochondrion. Still looks more or less like a bacterium, and I showed you the little parts um, that are in there. Uh, it was funny, right after lecture, I went back to my lab. I picked up a recent issue of Science, and I opened up uh, to a page that said something about rats that had been uh, bred uh, to be very, very poor at aerobic exercise. And it went on to talk about all the health problems they had. And the sentence, there's a sentence in there that they think the underlying cause is by breeding these rats and selecting for rats that are poor at, at uh, doing aerobic exercise. What they think it all stems from is, is having very inefficient mitochondria that don't work nearly as well. And that would make a lot of sense. I was going to scan that article, but it didn't quite. We had some technical issues this morning. Maybe I can show it to you next lecture. OK, so the one last thing then um, that I want to do is I want to say a few words about um, the photosynthesis, because that actually preceded respiration. Respiration couldn't evolve until there was oxygen in the atmosphere. So probably the first use, or one of, certainly one of the first uses of the, of, of the proton gradient happened in this scale of, of evolution and put here somewhere maybe 3.4 billion years ago or so, when what I had called uh, photosynthesis 
release one on, on day one in a sort of trivial fashion. This is known as uh, cyclic photophosphorylation. And the, the principle is, is relatively simple. It's to capture the energy in sunlight to make a proton gradient. And that then can be used, as you now know, to make uh, ATP. So in order to do, capture energy from uh, sunlight, uh, nature had to evolve. Molecules are able to absorb in the appropriate uh, wavelength range. You know the names of those molecules, chlorophyll. They come in two principal species. You don't have to remember the structure. What you can see, a lot of conjugated double bonds. That's how you sort of tune the absorption of a molecule. If you want to make it absorb at longer and longer wavelength, you start hooking together. Double, double bonds, and you can set it up sort of you can get a molecule to absorb at just about any maximum, maximum absorption in any wavelength you want. So chlorophyll is able to absorb this, this energy. And the principle of this is what happens is you have this chlorophyll, and it gets, it absorbs a photon. And the electrons, an electron in this gets excited. So it basically moves to an outer orbital. It's farther away. In the nucleus, it's easy, easier now for that electron to get lost than it was before. Now, if nothing was happening, that, that electron would eventually just fall down to its ground state, and you'd lose all the energy as heat. So what happens in, in photosynthesis, though, is that the electron falls back down to the, the ground state again in a series of steps. And how this happens, it, the electrons are basically getting passed from one carrier to another. And the same principle as we saw in respiration applies in that at each phase in here, a proton is pumped. Now, the out in the, um, the, out and the in are reversed from um, what it says in respiration. Uh, in the note, your notes in respiration, or it should be anyway. Um, but the in and the out is, as you'll see, it's sort of an arbitrary. You have to, uh, you take a fix, a, a frame of reference, and then something's in and something's out. The point is that in, in both of them, protons go from one side of the membrane to the other, and you get more on one side, you pump them in one direction, and them flow back in the other. And the in and the out is sort of an arbitrary way of describing what's happening. But in both, in both cases, the, the key thing is that you're, you're pumping electrons out. And then these can be used to make ATP, as we talked about with ATP synthesis. In this case, the electrons eventually end up back on the, uh, back on the chlorophyll. And so that's why it's called cyclic phosphorylation. What it does, what you get out of this, as you can see, is ATP. So this was probably a really big deal in evolution, because the current thinking is perhaps there was an RNA world that's still sort of being debated. At some point, it's clear that somewhere around 3.8 billion years or so, something that looks sort of like a present-day bacterium arose, probably eight molecules that had already been made in the sort of primordial soup. But when those started to run out, then it needed other ways of making energy, needed other ways of making carbon. Here's a way of getting energy. but. What's available to make more organic molecules is only carbon dioxide. And if you remember that little thing I showed you of if we're going increasing, going from a methyl to a hydroxyl to a aldehyde to an acid to CO2, that direction is oxidation. And that direction is reduction. So if we go in that direction and we, we end up generating NADH, because we're taking the electrons and giving them to something else, if we want to go the other way, what we have to, if we're starting with CO2, what we need to do is we need to have a supply of reducing power so we can take the CO2 and get it down to all the less oxidized states that are necessary for building all the molecules that we've been 
we've been talking about. So making ATP was a great idea, but the cells still needed to have some form of reducing agent. And what they used was they used hydrogen sulfide. This was one of, at least one of the major ways that it was done. And so they take NA. D, no, there's a very slight twist here. This is NADP. It's the same molecule as NAD, except there's an extra phosphorylation. And the one with the phosphate on it tends to be used in biosynthetic reactions. But otherwise, it's exactly the same thing. It's an electron banking thing. And what this gave was NADPH plus sulfur plus a hydrogen. So sulfur is a waste product. Here's the reducing power. Here's the ATP. That's what those organisms need to be able to synthesize uh, new organic material without having to have it pre-made molecules. A really big deal in evolution, and it's based on the, for making, the idea for making the ATP is based on this use of establishing a proton gradient, the same principle we've seen again. Now, there's another possible source of reducing power and that would be to use water as the source of the, the reducing power. But in order to do that, you've got you to put more energy into it. And this system wasn't able to handle it. But that happened soon enough um, with the development of what I called, on the first day, photosynthesis release two, which is technically known as non-cyclic. Photo phosphorylation. Again, it uses the energy of sunlight, but the twist this time, it not only makes ATP, it also makes NADPH. It makes reducing power at the same time. So you could see. That is a really major advance. If you can use sunlight to make both of them, now you're really uh, efficient. And th so this is how this one works. It's related to the other one. The first part's more or less the same idea. A photon is absorbed by a molecule of chlorophyll. It kicks the chlorophyll up to an activated state where the electrons uh, at a higher orbital farther away. It wants to come back down. Energy is going to be released. So electrons get passed. Protons get pumped from one side of a, of, a, of a membrane to another. Except this time, instead of coming back, the chlorophyll, this lands in a different chlorophyll that has just recently lost a pair of electrons. There's a, there's a new energy input here that kicks this chlorophyll up to an even higher energy state than this one. And as these electrons start to come down the energy hill, there's enough energy here to take a molecule of NADP plus, plus a hydrogen ion and give NADPH. There's one thing that this isn't going to work like a cycle or a machine yet. Anybody see what hasn't been taken care of yet? Say again? Send the electrons back to this chlorophyll. Exactly. So however now, the way the energetics is structured, now they're able to, the cells were able to take reducing power from here and generate 2H plus plus a half of an oxygen molecule. And so two, this would really be two waters giving four hydrogens and one oxygen molecule. So what you can see here now, there's a couple of really important things about this. It needs more energy. It makes ATP and NADH, NADPH, which leaves the cell able to carry out biosynthesis. And the third thing, which is an incredible influence on our planet, it started to generate oxygen as a waste product. And it's really a mixed blessing. I mean, we, it, 
oxygen is very reactive. It damages our DNA. It damages our proteins. We have an amazing number of defenses against oxygen. Um, but on the other hand, as it accumulated in the atmosphere and organisms slowly over evolutionary time learn to deal with it, it then set us up for the possibility of respiration, which as you can see is 18 times more efficient than in that ancient way of using glycolysis to make energy out of sugars. So um, that's more or less uh, the, the story. This, is, this part is called photosystem. Uh, two, this, this assembly of stuff is photosystem one. And I just wanted to show you this next slide because, I mean, chlorophyll isn't just floating around like this. As you might guess, it's bound into proteins and things. And someone has figured out the structure of photosystem, photosystem one. It consists of 12 proteins, 96 chlorophylls, and about 30 other molecules. And what it really does is it functions as an antenna some of the other molecules can absorb it at wavelengths that are, that are different from chlorophyll, and all the energy gets funneled into the chlorophyll and into this, this process. And you'll, you'll probably recognize by now that there are proteins here. We're seeing alpha helices and beta sheets in here as part, of this, as part of this structure. So the first organisms that learned how to do this were organisms we now know as cyanobacteria. They're kind of bacteria that has two membranes, like E. coli and like the other ones that we've talked about. You're familiar with these. There's the green scum you see on, on ponds. Here's a close-up. Sometimes they grow as filaments. The cells in a chain. You notice they're green. They're making chlorophyll. And what happened in plants was that apparently something, probably one of, something related to the present-day cyanobacteria got trapped inside some early progenitor of uh, what we now know as, as uh, plants and, and green algae. And be, this trapped bacterium became a chloroplast. And it had all the uh, machinery necessary to carry out this uh, non-cyclic photophosphorylation. The structure of these things, there's an outer membrane just similar to what I told you for the mitochondria. There's an inner membrane. And what's special about the mitochondria, and then there's another membrane inside that's known as the thylakoid. And that's where all the, that's where all the chlorophyll is. And the reason the out and the in is a little bit confusing in here is this part, which is probably the cytoplasm of the old bacterium, is pumped from what's known as the stroma. The stroma of a chloroplast, which is equivalent to the cytoplasm of the original bacteria, into the lumen. So the chlorophyll that's in this membrane absorbs the light pumps protons into the lumen, building up a proton gradient, and then they flow back out in the other direction uh, and make ATP. Here's a picture of a chloroplast. Once again, looks an awful lot like the bacterium still that, that got captured. All this stuff in the inside, those are the thylakoid membranes that, um, that uh, carry out this specialized stuff. So there you have it. Uh, that's how cells, how life, the major ways that life has figured out how to uh, make energy. When Penny Chisholm starts to talk to you, she'll talk to you about how organisms adapt to various niches, things that live in the bottom of the ocean, things that live in various places. They all have to make energy. They all use some variation on these principles I've talked to you, and she'll then show you how they've got very clever at extracting energy out of all sorts of things by applying these principles in different ways. OK, so what we're going to start doing now is we're going to start talking about um, DNA. This is certainly a molecule that's fascinated me all my life. You should know from the first part uh, that it's built up of units known as nucleotides that have a sugar. It's a ribose sugar that's missing one hydroxyl, so it's a deoxyribose. The sugars are numbered uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I showed you that. 
uh, there'll be a, a phosphate and then one of these nucleic acid bases, either a pyrimidine or a purine. And the, in DNA, you find the pyrimidine bases are cytosine and thymine. And in uh, DNA, the purine bases are adenine and, and guanine. And then these subunits are polymerized together, in essence, splitting out water to give you a polymer. And uh, there's a, I didn't emphasize this too strongly the first time I showed it to you. It's going to become a very big deal over the next few, we, uh, few lectures as we begin to consider how uh, nature had to figure out how to replicate DNA and all sorts of implications go along with this. But there's a polarity to a strand of DNA. The, this is the five, what's called the five prime sugar. The primes indicate the numbers referring to the sugar, and the ones without primes are referring to numbers of, of uh, atoms that make up part of the nucleic acid base. So if we're looking at a chain, this is a five prime carbon of the sugar, that's the three prime. And so um, what you can see is the, the, this bond, which is really a phosphodiester bond, the phosphate group is formed in ester with this hydroxyl and with the hydroxyl that used to be here. So it's a phosphor, phosphodiester bond, and it runs. Uh, it, it's a five prime, three prime bond. It joins the five prime carbon to the three, uh, three the five prime carbon to the three prime uh, carbon up here. So that means if you're looking at a chain of DNA, if you come down this way, you're coming in the five to three prime direction. If we come up the other way, we're coming from the three prime end heading towards the five prime end. So you'll see me saying five prime, three prime. Now, as well. The, as I told you, the principal force that holds the strands of the DNA together are hydrogen bonds, three of them between a G and a C, and two of them between uh, an A and a T. And then the, they're a pair of strands, and they're actually running in opposite polarities. And this is something we have to contend with when we think about replication. Five prime to three prime in one direction, and five prime to three prime going in the opposite way here. And then, as all you, know, you all know, it's called the double helix. So it's actually not flat like this in space. It's in a three-dimensional, um, uh, twisted into a double helix. And the base pairs are held together by hydrogen bonds between these, the bases on the opposite strands down the middle of the molecule. And I like this little movie I showed you because you can see it pretty well. The, the nitrogens are blue. It's easy to see the bases. And the hydrogen bonds are right in the middle. And there's another force I didn't, mem didn't me mention, and it doesn't matter for this course, but when the bases sort of stack on top of each other, there's actually a kind of an extra stabilization that, that comes, comes from that. It's a gorgeous molecule. You all know it encodes uh, the genetic information. We're going to be talking about it a lot. But um, first thing. <laughs> I really wanted, I wanted, you know, I could just tell you it's the genetic information, but one of the really big discoveries in biology was that DNA is the genetic information. And a point I'm trying to help you learn here, a part, you know, I'm trying to teach you more than just facts, and I hope some of you at least will catch that. I'm trying to show you how biology is done. It's an experimental scientist. You don't sit down usually and figure it out. Instead, you start doing experiments, and you get all kinds of unexpected discoveries. And in general, as people work in these unexpected discoveries, ultimately, they come to these grand new insights that we, you know, sometimes would have been very hard to predict. So the, um, the real question that people wondered for a long time was they, we'll talk more about the history of genetics, but people knew that we clearly had inheritable traits. You could see it in your, in your kids. You could, people had been breeding plants and all sorts of things, breeding domestic animals. They sort of understood the principle of, of, of inheritance. When I tell you about Mendel, we'll begin to see how his thinking led to the idea that the inheritance wasn't just like a sort of like a liquid where everything mixed together. It came in units or particles, which we know as, of as genes. And so the idea that there were genes um, had been accepted by uh, certainly by the beginning of this century anyway, but nobody knew what they were made of. They were made of what, what property, the major properties uh, that they they had was they encoded, they clearly encoded information in some way. They must replicate because 
one cell could give two and on and on and on. So if you're going to pass it down in an inherited way, it ha they have to be replicated. And the third thing uh, was that people knew they somehow they could mutate or the information content that they encoded could be changed. You, again, you could see that, that you'd get a, uh, something, an altered characteristic, and then it would be propagated down through that line. That was the principle of breeding that people had done for ages, and uh, so they understood that. There was one other key thing they knew. They knew that, it was in, that these genes were in the nucleus, and I'll tell you the full story of how even that insight w was, uh, was arrived at. But I'll just show you for the moment. There's a little movie. This shows some chromosomes that are all bunched up and are just pulled apart at the time of cell division. Those chromosomes are, as we now know, are made of, of DNA. But in essence, what people had seen through the microscope was these chromosomes or colored things that they could stain. They could sort of see something had doubled. And just before the cell divided, the two sets separated, and each cell got a new set. So that's about what people knew. They had those properties. They were in the nucleus. They knew about as much as you do. They knew the major classes of biomolecules in a cell. So what do you think you would need to do to show that DNA encodes the is the genetic material, encodes genes? Find somebody near you, I'll give them a minute or so, to see what kind of, I'd like to hear what kind of ideas you come up with. Then I'll, gonna, I'll tell you how it happened, but I want to hear, why don't you think about it, just see if you can come up with a couple ideas for me, what you'd need to figure out. Okay, well let's let's just see what, see what sort of thing. So anybody, what kind of ideas anybody got? What would you want to make me believe that DNA is doing that? Or well, I think it's a protein for the moment. <laughs> That's what I think is most likely. But what do you think? Anybody got an idea? Mess up the DNA and see if we mess up the cell. How we can do that? I, I can break a cell open and I can, I guess I can purify DNA and I can analyze it and it's got four bases in it <laughs> and it's got a sugars and phosphates. At that point, nobody could sequence DNA. We didn't even know the structure. Yeah? Take it out of one cell and put it into another. Yeah. Take it out of one cell, put it into another. And what would you expect to happen then? Okay, so some, that's, that's, that's a really nice idea. So somehow, the, if you took the DNA and moved it from one cell to another, that the characteristic of this cell would be somehow carried over, okay? That's, in fact, the way it happened, but not as simply as, as that, as I'll tell you. But that's that, exactly the essence of it. One little problem, maybe see if anybody has a thought on this. If I purify DNA, I mean, nothing's ever really pure, right? You get it out, and there's always little bits of stuff. And someone can always argue, well, it, yeah, it's 99% DNA, but just the other bits you can't get rid of. Yeah? What if we use radioactive material? We use radioactive material. How's that going to help us? Like, for example, if, uh, so like, uh, DNA contain, doesn't contain uh, nitrogen, right? It does contain nitrogen. For example, like find any atom that only DNA contains in other systems. Don't contain. Well, it gets it gets a little complicated. You can label certainly nucleic acids have like phosphate in, in them, but so does RNA. That's that's going to be hard. And we got if I if I had a mixture of things, and and I wanted to prove whether something was DNA, let's say DNA, a protein, or something. You need some, some really specific way 
of saying I did something to the DNA and not to the protein or something like that. Have you heard anything in this course that is really specific? Enzymes. Do you think that would give you an idea for how you might do it? If I've got a tube and it's mostly DNA and maybe a bit of protein and something, and let's say his idea is working, that we can take the DNA from this cell and put it over in that into the second cell and see the characteristic changed. If I wanted to do something to show that it was the DNA in the, in the tube that was responsible, could you use an enzyme? And what kind of enzyme would you want? Just make, well, what characteristics would you like it to have? Nature's probably made it for you already. Like something that synthesizes DNA, something that breaks down DNA, any? Say I treated this tube with some kind of enzyme, what would we, and then I wanted to see the outcome. What would we want? An enzyme that did what? Anybody else got an idea? We're, you're saying, asserting that it's the DNA in my prep. I like your idea, but I need to prove it. So I need to do something to show that it's actually the DNA and not the other stuff. So if I had an enzyme that did what to the DNA? If it broke it down, yeah, we could treat it. And if your idea is right, if we treat the stuff with, with something that specifically breaks down DNA, it won't get transferred. That makes sense? Okay, I mean, that's a way you could go out of a proof of this. And in fact, that's what happened, but I'm gonna quickly tell you how it actually happened. And again, you know, as I say, I'm trying to tell you a few things that are besides, here's the facts that you have to need to know on exam. There's a bigger picture here, and this is how research goes, and particularly in an experimental science such as biology. The important early work on this came from a guy who was known as Frederick. His name was Frederick Griffith. He was in London. He was a physician. He was working in the 1920s. And he was studying pneumonia. That's an infection of the lungs. By bacteria. There's, a, there's, one, there's more than one kind of bacterium will cause pneumonia. But one of the really important ones clinically was streptococcus um, pneumoniae. So it was a bacterium. It was, uh, it was given that, uh, that name. It's a common, we all have bacteria on us. We, I think I told you we have about 10 to the 12th on our skin, for example. And if pseudomonas, uh, excuse me, if streptococcus is on your skin, it's not a problem. But if it gets into your lungs, it's a problem. And so to live with all these um, bacteria um, they, uh, with us, our bodies have defenses. So that we have uh, this immune system we'll talk about more in a bunch of defender cells. Things that you know as white blood cells are defenders. Um, let's just see here. I'm going to show you this little movie. This is one of your white blood cells, a special kind of white blood cell. That little thing it's chasing is a bacterium. These round things. <laughs> are red blood cells. I mean, it doesn't look like a dog going after a mouse or a cat going after something. It's chasing it. It can tell it's there. It's, this is remarkable. It's, uh, and it's a little pixelated, but this is real. It's going to catch it right about there. And it eats it. I mean, we have these cells in, inside us. That's why you don't die, even though we live in a world that's surrounded by, uh, by uh, bacteria. OK, so we'll, we'll go on. Um, so getting pneumonia in the, in the old days was, in those days, was a really bad uh, uh, thing. You, you get infected, you get this uh, in, in your lungs, and then you'd have four to six days of high fever. And then the patient would go, would reach what's termed as a crisis. And one of two things would happen. They'd either live or they'd die. And that was it. I mean, this was no fun if somebody you knew had it because you didn't know the outcome and the outcome wasn't necessarily very good. Now you call up the doctor and they pump you full of antibiotics, but antibiotics hadn't been discovered yet. So this was pretty serious business and people were trying uh, to understand what was happening. 
Well, what was what goes on? What was going on during those uh, during these four to six days that then led to one of these two outcomes? Well, it turns out that uh, Streptococcus is a bacterium like this that has around it. So that's the bacterium. And it has around it something known as a capsule. And what that capsule is, is polysaccharide. Remember back to the second lecture when I was confusing you all by showing you how sugars could hook together in all manner of different ways. Well, that's what polysaccharides are. You just hook a bunch of sugars together, and you, for this course, you don't have to remember link, the linkages particularly. You just have to understand that there are different kinds of linkages, and every time you hook at it in a different way, you get a different kind of, of uh, polysaccharide out of it. But anyway, the, uh, the bacteria make these, this capsule of polysaccharide, and it's full of hydroxyl groups from all those sugars, so it attracts a lot of water around it. And what it does is it causes a problem for those defender cells that we just saw. Those would be, for example, a macrophage, a kind of white blood cell. And it can't eat something that's got the capsule. Now this is, uh, here's a picture of one of these capsules on one of these kinds of bacteria. You can sort of see it out here. It's polysaccharide, that's the main part of the bacterium. And here's a, another pixelated thing of, a, of one of these white blood cells eating a, bac a bacterium that doesn't have a capsule. But watch what happens if the bacterium has a capsule. It can't get hold of it. It just can't quite grab hold of it. So what, what happened during those, those days, though, was this capsule, which is a foreign um, uh, entity to your body, gets recognized by your immune system. And they, your immune system made antibodies that could recognize that. We'll talk about what these are. But what you, all you need to know for the moment is that they're proteins, and they, have a, they can be tuned to recognize some chemical entity with a very, very high degree of specificity. So what the body was doing during this thing was trying to make antibodies that would help it, rec that would recognize this capsule. And then it decorates the capsule with these things. And once it puts anybody stuck all over the surface, now it can get hold of it. And again, in a fact, you don't have to know. These, these are turned, the, this whole process is called opsonization, or these things. The reason they use the word opsin, because opsin is the uh, Greek word for seasoning. And it was as if these white blood cells like to have their bacteria seasoned correctly before they can eat them. And what's really going on is that they're decorating them with antibody. So what was going on after a person got sick? It was a race between their immune system trying to make antibodies which would let their immune system suppress the infection and the bacterium which is replicating unchecked for the first few days. And that's why uh, it was such a scary business because you didn't know what the outcome was and things could tip it one way or the other. Well, this did suggest a kind of therapy. Uh, the kind of therapy would be to isolate isolate a capsule to inject a horse get the antibodies from the horse why a horse a horse is huge right <laughs> it makes a lot of a lot of antibodies a lot better than injecting a mouse if you want to get antibodies um, so get antibodies and then inject the patient. It's a good idea in principle to see what you do, you're sort of short circuiting this whole process. Problem was uh, there were 20, more than 20 kinds of capsules. And so what uh, people had to um, uh, people had to do was they had to isolate the bacterium from, from the patient, determine the type of capsule. Let's say it's sort of from capsule one up to capsule type 20, which one it was, and then in inject the correct antibody 
So this was nerve-wracking because it took a while for the bacteria to grow, so it was a pretty tight time window. If you saw the patient right away, that's good, but if they were partway down the infection, not so good. Um, so the one other thing, they didn't actually, to do this, they didn't bother all the way to isolate the capsule. What they would usually do is use heat-killed bacteria. And that, would, then you'd have the capsule and everything, the bacterium's dead, it can't do anything, they'd inject the horse with that, and that would get you the antibodies to the capsule. So what um, Griffith was doing was he was fiddling around with, uh, with this system, and there was one other discovery that he made. Perhaps it wouldn't surprise you that since the bacteria are surrounded by a molecule that absorbs water, that the, the capsules would look sort of glistening. They absorb a lot of water. You can see they look here. So what they discovered, so if they, if they have a capsule, you get what are called smooth colonies. And the word colony in this thing just refers to, it started out as one bacterium and it kept dividing and dividing and dividing and maybe there's 10 to the 8th or 10 to the 9th bacteria in that little colony. But you can see it, they've all got capsules on the outside so it attracts a lot of water and it looks wet. And those are what you saw. But what they found, if you waited or grew the cultures up, that you would see some things that looked dry, or they called them rough. And these turned out to be bacteria that lacked a capsule. And so if you might start with a smooth strain, um, S here, and a and then isolate from it a rough strain might designate it in that kind of way. So this is the sort of thing that uh, Griffith was fooling around with. So um, he started with doing this kind of experiment. He took a smooth strain, making a capsule of capsule type 2. Okay, So he was injecting a mouse with this. And what happened? No, this was dead. This was a virulent form of the of the bacterium. So he took if he took the the rough mutant, injected the mouse. The mouse is alive, and you saw why. If it doesn't have the capsule, your def the def mouse's defender cells, white blood cells, could eat it. Then he had heat killed. S3. So this was a strain of uh, Streptococcus that was, uh, had a different capsule, a type 3 capsule, but he was heat killed. Why was he working with heat killed stuff? Because that's what you injected the horses with to get it. So uh, what do you think would happen here? Since the bacteria are dead, probably not a big surprise. The mouse is alive. Now I don't know whether he did this on purpose or he did it as a control. But what he did was he injected, at the same time then, R2 plus heat killed uh, S3. So he's got two things that don't do anything. He injects a mouse, and uh-oh, mouse dies. That is a weird result. That is actually also, though, the first really key step to understanding that DNA is a genetic material. It doesn't look like it at this point, probably, but it was. This is where, this is how we learned this really enormous fact from these experiments. He wasn't trying to figure it out. He was trying to work out something else, as you can see. But it was a bizarre finding. So what would you think? I put in some that used to have an R2 capsule, so did it get rejuvenated somehow by this heat killed thing, or as you'd suggested, did some characteristic get transferred from here, whatever. So he isolated the bacteria out of this, and what he found now was he had a live bacteria that were making S3. So something had been transferred from this set of dead bacteria into the bacteria that were alive, and the characteristic had been passed from the dead bacterium to the new bacterium, the other bacterium. So this is uh, about what Griffith did, but this problem was picked up by uh, 
a scientist at, at Rockefeller, uh, um, Avery, uh, Oswald Avery, who worked with, um, with uh, is, is part of a, a team, and he took this finding uh, and started to work on it and tried to figure out, because he saw in this, um, uh, in this result a way of finding out what was the genetic material, because somehow what was in that heat killed S3 was the stuff that would tran transfer genetic information to another bacterium. So he did one, he made one really big discovery, and that was you didn't need the mouse at all. <laughs> all that was happening was the mouse was, by dying, was in essence selecting for smooth bacteria. So he could s simplify things by just taking a rough bacteria, taking the heat killed extract, putting it in, and now he just looked for smooth colonies. Didn't need any mice at all. <laughs> so he was able to, to see the characteristic of the capsule being transferred from some kind of heat-killed mess of things into a rough bacterium, changing it into a live bacterium. So he started fractionating, and he did exactly what uh, the kind of approach that you suggested. And he purified, and he purified, and he purified, using as his assay this ability to pass on this smooth characteristic. And what he ended up with was virtually pure DNA. But as I said, you know, it's always never quite pure, and somebody can always argue, well, you got a little bit of something else in there. So he did a really key experiment, and he treated with DNAs, your experiment. And it lost the transforming activity. So this process that, uh, the, of doing this was called transformation. Initially, it described that phenomenon. Now that we know what, what matters uh, in the thing was taking DNA and putting it in. So if you do a Europe somewhere here, you clone a piece of DNA into a plasma and you stick it into E. coli so you can grow it up, everybody will, you'll call that process of taking the naked DNA and putting it inside the bacterium, you'll call it transformation. Now, in fact, it wasn't, this result wasn't accepted right away. This was published in 1944. And the general realization that DNA uh, was the genetic material, really didn't come to the 50s. Yet this result proved it, if you will. But part of the problem was the world wasn't yet ready to accept that DNA was a genetic material. And maybe you can see the problem. It looked like a monotonous molecule. It only had four different things, things that were different in it. And if you isolated, they were all often kind of in there and about the same amount. People thought it was just an endless GATC. It didn't sound like anything. You could encode information, whereas proteins looked really attractive. 20 different amino acids, they all had different characteristics. That was a great place for storing information. So the world wasn't quite ready to accept it, even though the experimental evidence was there. And, and so the result came later. Now, the last thing I just want to show you is because there's a kind of direct link from that Avery experiment to you guys, because in a, a year or two ago, it was the 50th anniversary of the discovery of DNA. And uh, Avery worked with a team of um, uh, two other people called McLeod and McCarty. This, uh, I, this was at the 50th anniversary, the meeting down at Cold Spring Harbor celebrating it. Uh, McCarty is the only, was the only member of the team alive. There he was. I asked him to autograph my program. There was his signature. He just died uh, a little while ago. and so. There's no living connection to that anymore, but I have a picture to show you guys that takes you back from that experiment to his signature right there. Okay, so I'll tell you some more stuff next lecture. Have a good weekend.